Biological information, overlapping codes. We've been talking about the book Biological Information, New Perspectives, which is edited by uh, a number of people from, uh, uh, who are familiar with the uh, intelligent design movement. Um, it's published by World Scientific Publishing, as some of you may remember it. Uh, was originally intended to be uh, printed by Springer Verlag, and um, there was a huge outcry, and Springer Verlag uh, dumped the book strictly illegally, but there wasn't much that could be done about it. It was published in 2013, and it's a collection of the proceedings of a symposium held in 2011 at Cornell. Not officially sanctioned by the university, but they rented out the uh, auditorium, and uh, John Sanford lives at Cornell as a professor there. Um, the book can be found, all the chapters listed one by one, uh, at that web address, World Scientific, which I thought was really nice because uh, the book costs $178 retail, and uh, you can probably get it at Amazon for $130, $140 or something like that. A uh, pretty expensive book, and they're letting you look, look at it for free. Uh, I do urge those of you who find it useful to buy the book, if for nothing else, to support World Scientific in what it did rather courageously, considering what had just happened to Springer. The book looks like that. Um, inside the book, there's a general introduction, biological information and genetic theory, which is wh where we are right now. Theoretical molecular biology and biological information and self organizational complexity theory. So, this is not exclusively um, an intelligent design book, although it does have um, an orientation towards the idea that uh, standard neo Darwinism is not enough to, uh, to explain biological complexity at least not biological specified complexity. <coughs> the, the chapter we're looking at now is entitled Multiple Overlapping Genetic Codes Profoundly Reduce the Probability of Beneficial Mutation. I thought that was a long title, which is fine, but for our purpose I'm going to shorten it to Overlapping Codes. It's written by uh, George Montañez, uh, Robert Marx, the third, Jorge Fernandez, and John Sanford. And um, their uh, contact information, or at least uh, uh, the corresponding answer, uh, author of John Sanford has uh, got his email there. There is growing evidence that much of the DNA in higher genomes is polyfunctional. With the same nucleotide Contri uh, contributing to more than one type of code. Such polyfunctional DNA should logically be multiply constrained in terms of the probability of sequence involvement via random mutation. We describe a model of this relationship which relates the degree of polyfunctionality and the degree of constraint of mutational improvement. We show that A, the probability of beneficial mutation is inversely related to the degree that a sequence is already optimized for a given code. B, the probability of beneficial mutation drastically diminishes as the number of overlapping codes increases. The growing evidence for a high degree of optimization in biological systems and the growing evidence for multiple levels of polyfunctionality within DNA both suggest the mutations that are unambiguously beneficial must be especially rare. The theoretical scarcity of beneficial mutations is, is compounded by the fact that most of the beneficial mutations that do arise should confer extremely small increments of improvement in terms of total biological function. This makes such mutations invisible to natural selection. Beneficial mutations that are below a population selection threshold are effectively neutral in terms of selection and so should be entirely unproductive from an evolutionary perspective. We conclude the beneficial mutations that are unambiguous, not deleterious at any level, and useful, subject to natural selection, should be extremely rare. Those of you who were, remember us going through 
uh, uh, genetic entropy, you may remember that uh, John Sanford uh, uh, mentioned this in his uh, work. Introduction. It is almost universally acknowledged that beneficial mutations are rare compared to deleterious mutations. Almost. However, there is controversy regarding just how rare beneficial mutations actually are. It appears that beneficial mutations may be too rare to actually allow the accurate measurement of how rare they are. For decades, it has been widely thought that beneficial mutations might be as rare as one in a million. However, more recently, some have argued that beneficial mutations might be much more common. And you're going to go, what? And we're going to go through why some people think that. The actual rate of beneficial mutations is a crucial question because if it determines both the speed and the direction of genetic change. If beneficial mutations are extremely rare, this profoundly limits the rate and range of all forward genetic change. Furthermore, to the extent that beneficial mutations may be extremely rare, the question arises, how can there be any net gain in total biological fitness? This question arises because it is widely recognized that in large genomes, most mutations should have very small effects. And so large numbers of low-impact mu low deleterious mutations should not be subject to purifying selection. You recognize that theme in genetic entropy. This means that over la time, large numbers of such deleterious mutations should accumulate continuously, leading to ever-increasing genetic load. In order to halt such genetic deterioration, one must invoke the continuous amplification of a large number of beneficial mutations to fully compensate for all the accumulating deleterious mutations. Fisher addressed the problem of the rarity of beneficial mutations as long ago as 1930. This is a classic article. He argued that beneficial mutations might be quite common. In fact, there's a theorem that he put out, which sounds like it's mathematically proved. He used the illustration of focusing a microscope. A random change in focal length has a nearly equal chance of either improving or diminishing the focus, assuming three things. One, the microscope is significantly out of focus. Two, the change in focus is very small. And three, focus is just a one-dimensional trait, a single knob turned either up or down. We now know that Fisher's three necessary conditions do not apply to the real biological world. Biological systems are highly optimized, and there's a pretty close to focused already. Um, a beneficial muco mutation must be subject to selection, so its biological effects must not be too small, so very tiny changes in focus are not feasible because they're not noticed by natural selection. And fitness is extremely multidimensional. There is much more to biological functionality than optimizing a single parameter such as focal length. <coughs> Fisher acknowledged that focusing a microscope just involves optimization, optimization in a single dimension and conceded that to the extent that fitness is not a simple one-dimensional trait, his analogy would break down. He went on to show that as the number of dimensions in fitness increase, the probability of beneficial mutations should rapidly decrease. This insight was profound, yet in his day he could not have realized how extremely multidimensional biological fitness really is. Fisher lived before the revolution in biology. He knew nothing of cell biology, molecular biology, or molecular genetics. Remember the genetic code came along in uh, uh, 1953 or so. And if that's what really happened and Fisher's writing in 1930, he wouldn't know about uh, the DNA code at all. We now know that total biological fitness is multidimensional in the extreme. In a sense, every functional nucleotide within a genome, every functional nucleotide, we're going to leave out the non-functional ones, adds another dimension to the fitness equation. So in a sense, Fisher's allegorical microscope has millions of knobs that must be focused simultaneously and interactively. In the last decade, we have discovered still another aspect of the multidimensional genome. We now know that DNA sequences are typically polyfunctional. 
Trifonov previously had described at least 12 genetic codes that any given nucleotide can contribute to and showed that a given base pair can contribute to multiple overlapping codes simultaneously. The first evidence of overlapping protein coding sequences in virus, viruses caused quite a stir, but since then it has become recognized as typical. According to Kapranov et al., it is not unusual that a single base pair can be part of an intricate network of multiple isoforms of overlapping sense and antisense transcripts, the majority of which are unannotated. The ENCODE project has confirmed that this phenomenon is ubiquitous in higher genomes, where in a given DNA sequence routinely encodes multiple overlapping messages, meaning that a single nucleotide can contribute to two or more genetic codes. More recently, Itzkovitz et al. analyzed protein coding regions of 700 species and showed that virtually all forms of life have extensive overlapping information in their genomes. So not only are there many knobs in Fisher's microscope analogy, each one can affect multiple traits simultaneously and interactively. Uh, to try to stretch the analogy, it's as if there are a whole bunch of microscopes whose uh, focusing apparati are stuck to each other. So that when you turn one knob, you turn the other knobs at the same time. In light of these new developments, it is timely to re-examine the question of the probability of beneficial mutation, the utility of Fisher's model, Fisher's theorem, and Fisher's insight about multiple fit fitness dimensions. This paper examines the probability of a selectable beneficial mutation arising within a DNA sequence that is functional, hence must be significantly optimized, and contains multiple overlapping codes. Method and results. The model for illustration in figure one, we show a hypothetical 100 base pair sequence in which, which participates in 12 partially overlapping codes. And there's figure one. And if you look at it, you can see that it depends on where you are. If you're out here, you only have two overlapping codes. If you are going through about 45, 50, you're getting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven overlapping codes. Oh, uh, correction, eight, because there's the bottom one, too. So that gives you an idea of what you could be looking at. Starting assumptions. We only consider here a functional sequence. We assume that this sequence is not primarily junk DNA, but that for the most part it encodes information. Yet we allow for rare nucleotide sites within the functional sequence that are perfectly neutral. And for those, we just simply will ignore them in the analysis if they're really truly totally neutral. But remember, ENCODE says 80% of DNA, plus or minus, is functional, and therefore we're talking about most of DNA. We only consider here a functional sequence. We assume this, oh, let's see, each nucleotide within the functional uh, genome is classified by levels L1 to L12, um, depending on how many different codes it fits into. Uh, a nucleotide that does not contribute to a given code is considered neutral relative to that code. A nucleotide which does not contribute to any of the codes is considered perfectly neutral and will be designated L0 and will not be further analyzed in this particular case. Consistent with commonly used evolution models, we assume the optimization of a composite organism is determined by a single fitness function. The contribution of each code to fitness is assumed to arise by aggregation of constraint commonly found in multi-objective optimization. I'm sorry. We assume a, a high degree of optimization within each code, although this assumption can be relaxed and is a tunable parameter within the model. For the analysis and discussion, we assume 99.9% .9 of the nucleotide positions defining a code are already an optimal nucleotide. For those nucleotides that are part of a given code but are not yet the optimal nucleotide for that code, we assume that only one of the three alternative nucleotides will be an improvement 
relative to the existing suboptimal nucleotide. The other two will not. Mutations at such sites will therefore have one-third chance of being beneficial, but will still have a two-thirds probability of being deleterious. Another way to say this is that for a given site relative to a given code, there is a hierarchy of the most desirable nucleotide ranked first to the least desirable nucleotide ranked fourth, and that as a rule, the non-optimal nucleotide is ranked second rather than third or fourth. This reflects the idea that even if non-optimal, the existing nucleotide is not truly random. We assume independence in the designation of different optimal codes and such that the nucleotide deemed optimal for a given code at a position is chosen independently of the other nucleotides that are optimal for codes that overlap at that position. In other words, for position one, the first code may view G as the optimal nucleotide, whereas the second code may consider T the optimal nucleotide, or both may consider C optimal, etc. Although the nucleotide in a position may be shared by several codes in the case of overlap, we assume that a nucleotide for an optimal code sequence is chosen only with respect to other nucleotides within that same code and not with respect to other codes which may or may not overlap with it in the genome section currently or in the future. Modeling these optimal code sequence decisions as independent gives rise to the Bernoulli model presented here. If there's interaction between the optimality of the different codes and, the diff uh, and then the mathematics rapidly gets uh, close to intractable and perhaps more important, difficult to fit with um, any real life situation. Lastly, we make the simplifying assumption that beneficial and deleterious mutations have unit magnitude effects, such that if one of each is present, their combined effects effectively cancel out. Um, and that's, of course, a generous assumption because it may turn out that if you change something in one code, the other code gets much worse, in which case you're actually looking at something which is uh, uh, less optimal than the, your original. Analysis. We analyzed how overlapping codes affect the probability of beneficial mutation in three ways. The first analysis involves a very simple calculation of how multiple overlapping codes affect the theoretical probability of an unambiguously beneficial mutation. We define an unambiguously beneficial mutation as a mutation that causes a benefit in at least one code without causing any deleterious effects in any other code. The second analysis is more involved and it examines the probability of a net effect beneficial mutation. A net effect beneficial mutation is a mutation that improves more codes than it disrupts. And of course a truly a net effect beneficial mutation would improve more codes to a greater extent than the codes that it disrupts. The last analysis involves an empirical analysis of how overlapping English words, for example as a crossword puzzle, affect the probability of creating a, valid, a new valid word. Um, I will uh, briefly mention that when we get there, but I think this is probably the least helpful part of the paper. First level of analysis. When we consider polyfunctional nucleotide sites, it is relatively simple to calculate the probability of mutations which are unambiguously beneficial. That is, beneficial in one code and not deleterious in any other code. For example, let us assume that all codes are 99.9% .9 optimized, such that 99.9% .9 of all mutations will be deleterious for any given code. Even for that one in a thousand site, which is suboptimal, on the average, uh, only about half of the nucleotide substitutions at su such a site will be an improvement, which in the simple analysis we can ignore. So they're going to assume they're all an improvement. For L1 nucleotides, the rule of unambiguity, uh, pardon me, rule of unambiguously beneficial mutations will be at best one in 10 to the third. For L2 nucleotide, this rate will be at best 1 in 10 to the 3rd times 10 to the 3rd or 10 to the 6th. And for L3 nucleotides, this rate will be at best 1 in 10 to the 9th, 1 in a billion. 
um, generalized for an L to the N or, or L sub N nucleotide, the rate will be at best 1 in 10 to the 3 N. Overlapping codes by their very nature make unambiguous mutations vanishingly rare. This means that within all polyfunctional nucleotide sites, essentially all beneficial mutations, that should have been unambiguous uh, beneficial. All beneficial mutations will at best be ambiguously beneficial, being beneficial at just one level, but simultaneously being deleterious at one or more levels. Therefore, at any polyfunctional nucleotide site, a beneficial mutation will almost always cons still consistently have deleterious effects, systematically eroding the total amount of information in the entire information system. Second level analysis, this is the more complex one. We can calculate the probability of a net effect beneficial mutation for each nucleotide level L1 to L12 as described below. Within a given code, assume that the sequence are highly optimized. We use a probability optimal uh, equals 99.9% or 0 0.999 of all nucleotides being optimal in our recurrent example. In the case of optimal nucleotide bases, any change is deleterious, assuming no neutral changes. Therefore, only R, which equals 1 minus P optimal, or 0 0.001, are subject to beneficial mutations. The, there are absolute, no absolutely neutral positions in any given code because by definition, such a position is not part of that code. Remember, we excluded the L0 uh, ones. The conditions for net beneficial or net deleterious changes, therefore, are as follows. To be a net beneficial mutation, the current nucleotide in that position must be non-optimal because if you hit an optimal, that doesn't really help you. That's already optimal. Um, in fact, it's likely to hurt. The change must be a beneficial nuclei, must be to a beneficial nucleotide, which occurs with a pro within a one-third probability, denoted as P beneficial um, line non-optimal, or given non-optimal. Uh, that's actually Bayesian. Um, which someday we should go over. Uh, to a de net deleterious mutation, the current nucleotide in that position can be optimal, and therefore we're making it worse, or the change must be to a deleterious nucleotide, uh, even though it's not optimal. We, uh, we wanted G, we started with T, we changed to A, it's not optimal. Um, still, which can occur with the two-third probability, denoted as 1 minus p beneficial given non-optimal. And that means that the probability of beneficial mutations equals p non-optimal times p beneficial given non-optimal plus p optimal times b p beneficial optimal. And that can be reduced to P non-optimal because uh, this term goes to 1 and that term goes to 0. Uh, and that means that this is the same as 1 minus P optimal times P beneficial non-optimal or because 1 minus P optimal turns into R, we have R times P beneficial given non-optimal. Given the stated assumptions for any single code, a mutation in that at a position chosen at random that mutates has a probability of being a beneficial mutation equal to PB, which equals to one-third uh, times R, which is zero point, in, instead of 0 0.001, it's 0 0.00033. 333. This, in turn, means that a random position that mutates has a probability of being a deleterious mu mutation equal to 1 minus PB, which equals to 0 0.9996666 bar. A mutation occurring to 
a single nucleotide may be beneficial or deleterious for any given code. As per previous discussion, neutral cases are excluded. Let's consider a few specific cases before generalizing. If the nucleotide is an L1 nucleotide, then there is only one possibility. A mutation will be either beneficial or deleterious with PB equals 0 0.00033 and 1 minus PB equals 0 0.0 pardon me, 0 0.99967. If the nucleotide is an L2 nucleotide, then there will be four possibilities. A mutation may be beneficial for both codes. A mutation may be beneficial for the first code and deleterious to the second code. A mutation may be deleterious to the first code and beneficial to the second code. Or a mutation may be deleterious to both codes. And if you assume that this is um, equally distributed. For such nucleotide positions, there's a value for each code, each of which is either beneficial or deleterious. We make the simplifying assumption that where there's a beneficial effect in one code and a deleterious effect in another code, these effects will essentially cancel, leaving a neutral effect. Therefore, B, B will be beneficial, DD will be deleterious, and DB and BD will be neutral. In that case, P beneficial equals PB equals PB squared, which is 1.11 times 10 to the minus 7. <coughs> Remember, it was originally 3.3 times 10 to the minus 4th, which we've just lost three, um, three orders of magnitude. P neutral equals PBD plus PDB and... Um, the math works out to 6.66 times 10 to the minus fourth. And P deleterious equals 0 0.99933. Now notice that technically it's not 0 0.9999988. But the difference between 0 0.99933 and 0 0.9999988 is so small as to be negligible, and if you put 1 times 10 to the minus 7th divided by either one of those, the answer comes out to be basically 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7th. In all other cases where most, more than two codes are involved, there can be more than two factors to consider. For example, for L3 positions, there are three levels of multi mutational effect. If the nucleotide is an L to the N nucleotide, then there will be roughly two to the N possibilities. To generalize, uh, no, you don't want to know this one. Um, I will just say that this is a very easy p uh, thing for a computer to calculate because all it's got to do is go through the steps one at a time and put in the numbers. That's why we have computers to do those things instead of people like you and me. Uh, the value of PBL, the probability of beneficial mutation in equation one, rapidly goes to zero for increasing L when PB is much less than one. Because differentiating between probabilities like 10 to the minus 11th and 10 to the minus 22 is intuitively challenging, we propose the use of the information measure, which we've seen elsewhere. Uh, the information is equal to the log two of the a probability for beneficial mutations. And again, I'm skipping through this because um, reading the whole thing would take well over the time allotted. A high degree of optimization makes beneficial mutations unlikely, even when considering just one code. As more codes are considered, the probability of beneficial mutation diminishes rapidly, as is shown in figures 3, 4, and 5. The ratio of beneficial to deleterious mutations, which I'm not going over, by the way. If you want that, uh, go back to the original article. It is available free online, so you can do that. The ratio of beneficial to deleterious mutations it decreases so rapidly that for L3 nucleotides in highly optimized sequence, the number of deleterious mutations expected before the beneficial, first beneficial arose would be greater than the genome size of a typical bacterium. For L5 nucleotides, the number of deleterious mutations expected before the first beneficial 
arose would be greater than the genome size of a typical mammal. Which means basically it ain't going to happen. Well, relaxing the optimization assumptions reduces the severity of the problem, as can be seen in Figure 4. Increasing the number of overlapping codes diminishes the likelihood of attaining a net beneficial mutation, even for weakly optimized systems. <laughs> if we allow within a functional sequence for overall optimization values as low as 50%, deleterious mutations remain roughly 1,000 times more likely than beneficial mutations in the presence of 12 overlapping codes. That is, if each one was likely to be 50% beneficial, but you've got 12 overlapping codes, it doesn't really matter. You're still looking at huge numbers. As the organism becomes more optimized, the probability of receiving an overall beneficial mutation falls rapidly. We are forced to conclude that the polyfunctionality of DNA profoundly affects the expected rates of beneficial mutations. The growing evidence for polyfunctional DNA, therefore, suggests that unambiguously beneficial mutations should be vanishingly rare. And then this next section is entitled English Crossword, well, it's not entitled, it's, I think it's called Crossword Puzzles, but it's English Crossword Puzzles is what it's talking about. And, for example, you have dog and grateful, which overlap in the first letter of grateful and the last letter of dog. Okay. And they have a common letter G. And you can change the dog to dot and still get something that makes sense. But that changes grateful to the non-English traitful, which doesn't make sense. Deleterious change. However, in some cases, we can make an overlap, overall beneficial substitution so that if you do go dog and go overlap on the G, now we can change the G to T and we can get two as well as dot. Now, are English crossword puzzles precisely analogous to um, uh, to uh, DNA? Probably not. And so th that's why the value of this is only to give you a general idea rather than to be very precise. But it is interesting that in English, if you have 11 overlapping words similar to 11 overlapping codes in our biological model, we were unable to find a single example of an overall beneficial change during our tests. That means that if you have 11 words that have the exact same letter and you change them to any other letter, at least one of the words will not make sense. This is really rather striking when you think about it. Summary of results. For example, for those nucleotides that contribute to just three different overlapping codes, assuming each code is 99.9% .9 optimized, less than one in a billion mutations will be unambiguously beneficial. Possible objections. Contrary to the thesis of this paper, some scientists have argued, remember we had this before, that beneficial mutations might be extremely common, even approaching 50% of all non-neutral mutations. The concept that beneficial mutations might be extremely common traces back to some simple mental constructs suggested by Fisher. Fisher's paper is where that idea came from. Fisher's most famous illustration, as you may remember, was the example of focusing a microscope. And I'm going to skip some of that because we've been over it already. When a single trait is defined by just 100 functional nucleotides, that trait's genetic optimum is an extremely specific set of 100 base pairs. One specific set of 4 to the 100 sets, or 1 in 10 to the 60. If that trait is anywhere near its optimum, then there are a multitude of mutations which can make the trait worse, but there are very few opportunities to make the trait better. This is analogous to a random letter change in a text that results in a superior text. And by the way, if it's an original thing fresh from the hand of a perfect creator, every single mutation will make it worse. As a message becomes more and more complex and refined, a text change must be more and more specific in order to enhance that message. And hence, the greater the constraint, for achieving improvement via any random change. As this paper shows, the recent discovery of polyfunctional DNA vastly compounds this problem. To his credit, Fisher acknowledged that the chance of improvement via random change must approach zero, 
either when the focus is already near optimized, as the size of the change in focus grows larger, because it overshoots if it goes in the right direction, or as the number of dimensions defining the trait, uh, that is overall fitness, becomes larger. So he recognized the weakness of his own uh, theorem. There's another aspect of Fisher's theoretical work, which arose because he did not understand the genes uh, specify information, and that mutations are just errors in genetic specifications. Fisher imagined that all biological variation arose symmetrically. In the case of the focusing knob on a microscope, the knob turns equally well both ways. And Fisher imagined this would be equally true for mutations affecting any biological trait, such as height or vigor. There would be just as many mutations that increased performance as diminished it. This is the error underlying Fisher's famous fundamental theorem of natural selection. Given a population with performance levels following a bell-shaped curve, he reasoned that any level of selection will always remove at least some of the underperformers and will favor at least some of the higher performing individuals. This would consistently yield higher mean performance in the next generation. He then assumed that new, new mutations would arise creating the new variation symmetrically around the new mean. This is what led Fisher to believe he had a mathematical proof that continuous evolutionary improvement was unavoidable. And many have followed him since, I might add. But we now know that mutations are essentially word processing errors in the DNA, so new variation will be extremely asymmetrical and will be almost exclusively deleterious. So for example, apart from a small set of mutations within its promoter region, Mutations deleterious for a gene's function will be much more common than mutations for enhanced function, invalidating Fisher's theorem and negating his simple microscope analogy. A few recent studies have inferred extremely high beneficial mutation rates based on data from mutational accumulation experiments. Here's their critique of that claim. These MA experiments have significant problems. No actual mutations were actually seen. Fact-free science? <laughs> the beneficial and deleterious mutation rates were only inferred based upon the differential growth rates of a limited number of isolated strains. These experiments were not capable of identifying the vast majority of subtle mutations that arose in the populations. And furthermore, they're competing on agar. You take these out to the wild where they're not provided with all the food they can eat, and now they have to compete with other organisms and uh, live with uh, deficiencies and so forth. Um, maybe those changes that were good for agar are not necessarily good for the real world. They could only detect those few mutations that had large effect and that affected a single trait growth rate on a given medium, making inference about total mutation rates entirely unwarranted and also total fitness. The observed re effects in these two studies could be attributed to a specific one-dimensional adaptation which could arise due to a specific mutational hotspot or could even be due to an epigenetic effect. Lastly, unintentional selection could not be rigorously precluded. In other words, they're not really that convincing experiments unless you want to be convinced. In one case, the researchers tested the ability of yeast strains that were initially grown under minimal selection conditions to allow mutations to accumulate and then to grow slightly faster than the source strain in the same artificial me medium where the mutations had been accumulating. In that study, 5.75% of the derived lines grew faster than the parental strain under those specific conditions. By the way, notice that's not 50% even here. In a very similar yeast experiment, the researchers again minimized selection to allow mutation accumulation and then tested derived strains for ability to compete with the parental genotype in artificial medium. The second, in the second study, 25% of the derived lines outgrew the parental strain. 
not 50% there either. But in both cases, the researchers used extremely narrow and unnatural criteria for measuring fitness. However, natural selection as it occurs in the natural world must act on fitness in a much fuller sense. Another possible argument against the thesis of this paper might be that it is contradicted by a substantial volume of scientific literature that uses DNA sequence comparisons to infer historical positive selection events for great numbers of putative beneficial mutations. It is important to realize that the vast majority of the putative beneficial mutations claimed in these papers are just observed alternative nucleotides with no known biological function, the presumed benefits being inferred not being in any way understood or observed. We think it probably is better and therefore we're going to take it. A final possible argument against the thesis of this paper might be that our analysis involved point mutations but did not consider duplications. Some might argue that the genetic duplications are especially likely to be beneficial. However, in terms of immediate effects, duplications are more likely than other, other mutations to cause harm. Duplications are more likely to be immediately deleterious because unlike point substitutions, they scramble the genome, causing frame shifts and generally disrupting the genomic context and architecture. And some of those codes require things that fit together. Like the duplication of letters, words, or paragraphs in regular text, genomic duplications add nothing but systematically disrupt context. Furthermore, unlike other types of mutations, duplications increase metabolic load for the host cell in terms of DNA replication, repair, transcription, and translation. It takes energy to make all of those extra nuclei, uh, nucleotides. So if a duplication is neutral in terms of information, it is by definition a deleterious mutation. It's causing extra energy for no new effect due to the be increased metabolic cost. Can it be argued that even if duplications are not immediately beneficial, they might still be beneficial in the long run, producing large reservoirs of junk DNA, which could then serve as a breeding ground for future evolutionary experimentation and innovation? The concept of building up a large amount of junk DNA in the genome for possible long-term evolutionary benefit has several flaws, although it is extremely popular in the uh, vehemently Darwinist world. Firstly, the most recent evidence suggests that the genome is mostly functional and so there is little junk DNA. And of course that point is being vigorously disputed by the Darwinists to the point where some places like Wikipedia has kind of toned down the ENCODE study. Secondly, the huge metabolic cost of junk DNA would be immediately deleterious. So you're going from normal to deleterious right from the get-go. Thirdly, long-term benefits would be remote and hypothetical, while selection only operates in the present. The blind watchmaker doesn't know where he's going, remember? Um, and cannot anticipate future benefits. Fourthly, even within junk DNA, mutations can still be deleterious due to negative interactions with the functional genome. It has a function that we didn't really want. Lastly, the prospects for beneficial mutations arising within junk DNA is very problematic because like a letter within a text, no nucleotide is good or bad in itself, but only in the context of many other nucleotides. For example, just to give you an illustration, the word nucleotides, if you take the T and make it into an S, it is now nucleosides. Is that a beneficial mutation? It's a legal mutation in English. But it's only beneficial if you really meant nucleosides instead of nucleotides. Otherwise, it's a misleading and therefore a deleterious mutation. Within the context of a non-functional array of letters, it is not unreasonable to expect a spelling error to, it is not reasonable to expect a spelling error to ever to create useful information. Within any DNA sequence that is truly neutral junk, there is no frame of reference for the defining of a point substitution as being either beneficial or deleterious 
in terms, in terms of useful information. There is no functional context within which beneficial mutations could arise, with one major exception. Ironically, there is one type of beneficial mutation that should arise systematically within junk DNA, deletions. Essentially, all deletions within junk DNA should be beneficial due to improved metabolic efficiency. So to the extent that selection is actually operational, all junk DNA should be systematically deleted. This should happen long before enough beneficial mutations might accumulate within the junk DNA to give it a new and meaningful biological function. Conclusions. Our analysis confirms mathematically what would seem intuitively obvious. This should be beating a dead horse. Multiple overlapping codes within the genome must radically change our expectations regarding the rate of beneficial mutations. It makes them much, much rarer. As the number of overlapping codes increases, the rate of potential beneficial mutation decreases exponentially, quickly approaching zero. Therefore, the new evidence for un ubiquitous overlapping codes in the higher genomes strongly indicates that beneficial mutations should be extremely rare. This evidence, combined with increasing evidence that biological systems are highly optimized and evidence that only relatively high-impact beneficial mutations can be effectively amplified by natural selection, themes that you've heard in uh, genetic entropy, lead us to conclude that mutations which are both selectable and unambiguously beneficial must be vanishingly rare. This conclusion raises serious questions. How might such vanishingly rare beneficial mutations ever be sufficient for genome building? How might genetic degeneration ever be averted, given the continuous accumulation of low-impact deleterious mutations? Again, the major theme of genetic entropy. Now, my first reaction is, duh. I mean, obviously, the more interact, uh, interlocking the codes, the harder it is to improve one code while not degrading the others to a greater extent. And it's just intuitively obvious. Randomly improving both codes should be extremely rare. Uh, that's just, you know, you don't really need a mathematician for that. It would be nice to specify example codes so that we could, you know, show exactly what we're talking about in terms of real-life biology. However, given a few giving a few examples would lead to arguing over whether the examples were valid and whether they were generalizable. So there's a sense in which if they make the paper standalone, then you have to argue against the point of the paper rather than arguing against its applications. Perhaps more interesting, at least it was more interesting to me, the argument makes clear something that is not always appreciated and that I didn't understand before. Because I had these people saying, well, beneficial mutations are there all the time. Many evolutionists, ah, that's what happens when, that's a mutation. Uh, it, is, it is a dictated mutation. Um, that should read accept, and the, and the, uh, and the uh, program obviously misunderstand the word. Uh, many evolutionists accept Fisher's theorem uncritically. This leads to an expectation that mutations should be roughly 50% beneficial. I mean, after all, Fisher's was a classic paper, and it showed that beneficial mutations should be expected 50% of the time, it proved it mathematically. That is, if the assumptions were correct. And these people make the assumption that the assumptions were, are in fact correct. So when you hear them, listen to them and understand where they're coming from. This, I think, is a gross underestimate, uh, pardon me, overestimate, but I had never understood where it came from until I read this article. And for that reason, if that reason alone, I finally understand why they think that evolution is so likely. Fisher proved it back in 1930. Wow. Um, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. So do we have examples of overlapping codes? Uh, 
So well, in, in some of the references, they, there are some examples of overlapping codes, and maybe one of the so things we should do gene is bring mean? in some of those examples. So what we should probably do is to dig down deep into that particular reference and pull out some of the ones. But I can give you an example. Uh, as, as you probably know, there are um, small snippets, snippets of RNA whose major job is to attach to other snippets of RNA and foul them up and not allow them to be translated. Small inhibitory, it, small inhibitory RNA, S-I-R-N-A or, or something like that. And if you mutate the small inhibitory RNA, it will no longer bind to the right place. And perhaps it will bind to the wrong place as well. But if you mutate the RNA that is being translated, even though it's a simultaneous mutation that will still code for arginine, for example, now the small RNA will no longer fit to it, and so now that particular protein will be overexpressed somewhere. And so a mutation that looked like it was neutral is now deleterious. Well, what happens to the one that changes it from arginine to another amino acid? I have to look at the table to figure out exactly which one it was. Uh, let's say leucine, just to pull one out. And now it not only changes the protein at that point, but it also keeps the inhibitory RNA from binding it. That's a double function. And that's a double function that is now being ruined in both directions. That's the significance of having something that has two functions at one time. Um, uh, can we pass the microphone up? Go ahead. Th these concerns are basically not just for genetic uh, variability, but for any system that is tightly integrated. The more components the system has, the more integrated each component is in all the other components, the more difficult it is to just randomly substitute things with whatever else you think it might work. It's like if you have a gear that interacts with 10 other gears at the same point, suddenly you can't change that at all or you're going to mess up 10 different functions. Just a minute. The concept of polyfunctionality, is that a theoretical concept or we know that, that there are certain systems that overlap like, like the eight or, eight or nine times? Well, I'll tell you what. What we should probably do is take a break in our in our series here and go back to some of those papers and show where polyfunctionality actually exists. Now did Sanford's, when he talked about his stuff, was that irrespective of, of the mechanism or did it incorporate the polyfunctional uh, Sanford's book, Genetic Entropy, didn't really get very much into polyfunctionality. That's an additional layer. This is an additional layer on top of what Sanford had to say. Because, uh, yeah, I, I mean, to me, this the whole polyfunctional thing just well, increases the complexity. Uh, let's, let's go back and look at the literature and see what it has to say. Um, I'll, try to, I'll try to pull some of that out, and we'll take a look at it. Uh, it means you're going to be looking at T's and G's and A's and C's. And, uh, do it in December, because I'll be gone in November. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, um, if you wanted to put it off till December, we'll see if we can in, do that. In December, yeah. <laughs> there are essentially multiple genes that occupy the same genome space. Uh, some are out of register with respect to one another. Some are on the opposite side of the DNA. In other words, one would be antisense to the other, 
relatively speaking, though we were only concerned with the sense of the gene in the sense that it's translate, uh, transcribed. But you see, you can transcribe one gene in this direction and the antisense version of some portion of the gene in the opposite direction. And there is actually, in theory, you could be running three different genes concurrently on in one side. direction and three more in the opposite direction if, uh, if they're all of the same size. That's because they can be out of register with respect to one another. But when you're starting to talk about varying sizes, there are many examples of one gene going in this direction and several other genes going in the opposite direction on the um, antisense portion uh, that have nothing to do with uh, their very different sizes and everything. And, and trying to envision how you can evolve all three of them or five of them or however many there are at the same time it just boggles one's mind. They're putting numbers to it, but it does, it does not really make intuitive sense. The reason why I've been playing with some of these ideas is because I was thinking in terms of, all right, how, how do we maximize the storage of information in DNA? How, what are the limits to the total amount of information you can pack into it? And the moment I began to think in terms of these additional layers of complexity, geez, it, it begins to become simply mind-boggling. And this doesn't even begin to speak on the subject of the original doctrine that used to be the standard dictum. One gene goes to one trans um, messenger RNA goes to one protein. Now we know that one gene produces potentially many messenger RNAs, which any one of which can produce numerous different proteins. If you spell it in reverse, it can produce different gene products. Yes. Different proteins. Well, here's, here's the easy way to do that. It's that various ones have introns. Uh, various genes have introns. And there may be, let's say, let's say there are two introns. Okay, uh, that means you have an exon at the beginning, an exon in the middle, and an exon at the end. So you can produce, if you cut out those introns, the standard protein. But if you want to, you can cut out the, both introns as one giant intron, in which case the middle exon disappears, and now you have a protein that has the first and last part. Well, as you can imagine, if you have six or seven of these, you can have A, B, and F. You can have A, C, and F. You can have A, C, and E. Uh, the combinations rapidly go completely wild. And so you can have one protein, uh, one gene, that codes for 100 different proteins. Because you have an intron and an extron ec combined in a way that produces a different product? Or those are discrete? Well, the, ex the introns are supposedly always cut out. So but the problem is that you know sometimes they'll take problems. an exon with them. How do you combine the coding regions one with the other? They come in modules. You know what? And it's you recombine them. In Make it this way so we can get a three-way conversation the, going here. The alternative splicing is a very prominent um, feature of transcription these days and the alternative splicing is frequently seen as a feature in different cells in the same organism or perhaps at a different period of the cell cycle. And then you'd have to have different start and stop codes for those two? That's, well, the start and stop codon, even if it's the same, there are other combinations that are um, altered, for example, if you're talking about a kidney cell as opposed to a liver cell, as opposed to spleen or lung or brain or such. So you see, you may be using the same original gene, but you're going to express it in a very different way depending on where you are. 
As a matter of fact, this kind of thing turns out to have clinical significance. You've heard of beta HCG, you know, the pregnancy test? Why is it beta HCG? Because the alpha part of HCG happens to be identical to the alpha part of, if I remember correctly, LH. Uh, there's, there's two or three different hormones that have the same alpha and a different beta. And that's why they had to make antibodies to the beta HCG part of it instead of the alpha because otherwise uh, the luteinizing hormone goes up and, and you think the person, the lady is pregnant when in fact she just happens to be uh, at the point of ovulation. Uh, that's why the new pregnancy tests are so much more accurate than the old ones were. And that's why they can detect pregnancy so much earlier is because you can go a lot lower if you're testing for beta part of HCG than you could from alpha. So it turns out to be actually something that we've kind of known all along. We just didn't realize the extent of it until we started to look at protein sequences and gene sequences and realized that this kind of A, B, F, A, C, D, B, C, F uh, stuff goes on all the time. And then on top of that, then you have proteins when you finally have the product with multiple very different functions. For example, you have lens crystallins that in other cells have an enzyme function. Here they have a physical function of diffracting light. Over there they have an enzyme function of some other kind. So how are you going to optimize this? By mutation, randomly. So you mutate it so the eyes can now see better and now the enzyme function is lost. Yes. Now we should do a couple, a few classes just on a primer on the genetics for the, for the group. So try that one. Well, we'll try to we'll try to bring out some uh, some stuff on polyfunctionality of of, of genomic stuff. Uh, I think it'll be very interesting to see how much overlap there actually is. I read somewhere uh, about one gene could produce over well over three thousand different products. Uh, it depends on the gene. Some genes pretty much do one thing and one thing only, right. but some of them have a lot of overlap uh, and that's part of the point of this whole thing is that the, the genome is actually fairly compact and that means that you have overlapping codes and, and overlapping functions to any given code and so um, you wind up with those things it's very difficult to evolve positively and the fact that they're even there is very difficult to account for from that perspective. Well, again, those of you who are um, able, we're, we invite you to come to our, our meeting this afternoon. And uh, uh, next week we'll... Which room or which... This is uh, Centennial at the DeMazo Amphitheater. Um, and then next week we'll continue, I think we'll continue with the book, but we'll try to in December, we'll start a series especially on overlapping codes and what the actual evidence is. Who's speaking this afternoon? Uh, Leonard Brand, well actually the person that's running it is Jim Walters. And then uh, Richard Rice, Leonard Brand, myself, uh, Suzanne, and somebody by the name of Joseph, I think, from La Sierra is going to be there as well.